Number 10, just his bones and a beautiful memory. This one chokes me up every time. It's not only physically brutal, but emotionally brutal. Like so many superhero defeats that stick with me truly seem to be. In this case, it is Superman himself who is defeated by his friend and ally, Wonder Woman. This all goes down in the story from outside of the main continuity, Wonder Woman Dead Earth. In this comic, Diana awakens in a post-apocalyptic world, where she seems to have forgotten what happened to the planet. There was a great war, and following it a great fire and it is in issue 3 that she actually finds out the truth about what happened to this now dead earth and her involvement in that. What happened was the great fire and the great fire was her. In the past, in Dead Earth, the Amazons attacked humankind, and while Diana attempted to lead peace talks between both sides, this ultimately fails, and then the humans decide to basically nuke Themyscira. Diana's full power is unleashed when her bracelets are removed, but it's not enough to stop the nuclear strike against her home. In the end, her mom, her sisters, her entire world are all destroyed and lost to her. Superman rushes to help, but also arrives too late after prioritizing his own parents, who also were victims of a nuclear attack in small her power fully unleashed, heartbroken, and filled with rage, Wonder Woman takes out her frustrations on Superman. The two fight, and ultimately, this untethered and unlimited power that Diana has tapped into proves to be enough for her to destroy Clark after their fight also has obliterated the Earth via collateral damage. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button? I know there's a bunch of you that aren't subscribed, so, you know, if you want to subscribe, it just it helps us out. Number 9. the Just Justice League are dead. Welcome to Dark Crisis. Or really, welcome to Justice League issue number 75, the beginning of Dark Crisis. In this issue, the Justice League goes up against Pariah. Pariah used to be a scientist, trying to stop the death of universes, who basically became corrupted when he was cursed to watch worlds end over and over again, without being able to do anything to save them. I mean, to be fair, that would, I think, make pretty much anyone corrupted and kind of crazy. Pariah is back, and this time he intends to end the suffering of the multiverse by ending the heroes of the main continuity. He does this because he believes in destroying the main continuity, he'll kind of be able to end the cycle of destruction, seeing it as kind of the root of the problem because the heroes from that reality have in essence meddled too much with the state of the multiverse. So he's like, in order for us to save the multiverse, we kind of got to get rid of you guys. As a result, he seemingly handily defeats the Justice League in one go, blasting them with his own power after making them fight sort of the darkness, which is like an army of evil characters they fought before, but really it's just the darkness, leaving only Black Adam to survive, return to Earth, and tell the tale of what happened. Of course, the Justice League would return, because, you know, this is comics, we gotta come back around to it. But still, this issue and their initial fate here was pretty wild. Number 8, and that will be the end of the X-Men forever! What can I say? I'm a sucker for the classics. This one comes to us from the old days of X-Men, the Jack Kirby and Stan Lee days. In issues number 17 and 18 of Uncanny X-Men, Magneto is revealed to be the villain who has infiltrated the X-Mansion, having returned from outer space where we last saw him be transported to by the Beyonder. He has returned to once more resume getting revenge on the X-Men and mankind. It isn't until the end of issue 17 that Magneto is revealed as he greets the parents of Warren Worthington III, aka mutant student Angel's parents, having handily defeated almost all the X-Men one by one after luring them to the mansion. Magneto's plan is to send them up in an air balloon, which is basically like attached to a metal ball that contains them. Fortunately, while initially defeated in issue number 17 and struggling to escape in issue number 18, Iceman ends up getting showcased as the true hero in this issue. Kinda helps save the day here. Almost single-handedly defeating Magneto just as the X-Men escape their deadly air balloon fate and return to back him up. Number seven. Storm and Emma Frost. A bit of a lesser known rivalry between two comic book characters is the one between Aurora Monroe, Storm of the X-Men, and Emma Frost, the White Queen of the Hellfire Club. Now, Back in the day, Emma was a villain more than anything else, and during Uncanny X-Men 151 and 152, the White Queen ambushed Storm, using her telepathic powers to swap their bodies, and then enacted a plan for the Hellfire Club to attack the X-Mansion. Now, After a whole lot of kerfuffle involving Kitty Pryde, Emma lost control of Storm's powers, and that gave Storm the opportunity to swap their minds back. Storm gets the tempest caused by Frost under control, then saves the White Queen from a massive fall, all heroic-like, but 
being the villain, Emma tries yet again to attack Miss Monroe, prompting Storm to straight up smack Emma with a massive bolt of lightning. She flies up into the air, raging like the goddess she is, then flies back down, grabs Frost by the throat, and scares the hell out of her by almost taking her life before Wolverine, of all people, talks her back to morality. It's fantastic. I love Emma Frost, but I think because of this, I love Storm a little bit more. Number six, Kingpin versus Grey Hulk. The Hulk is an interesting character. He's gone through many changes over time, even having different identities than just his regular green, savage, smashy smash one. One of his first, when he was still a Grey Hulk, would be Joe Fixit. Joe Fixit is a persona of the Hulk who is a relatively intelligent Las Vegas mob enforcer. It's great. Well, this year, in 2023, he got his own series. Fixit is specifically the enforcer for the Berengeti crime family, and in the series, Mr. Berengeti's operation becomes the focus of a certain Wilson Fisk, aka the Kingpin of Crime, who is planning to strong arm a takeover. Problem is, you can't really strong arm anything when one of the people you're facing off against is the Incredible Hulk. The best part about Joe Fixit is the fact that no one seems to be able to work out that he is just another version of the Hulk, so he is constantly underestimated. Within the first few moments of Kingpin's meeting with Mr. Berengeti, the plan he had goes south very quickly, and he decides to smash the man's desk, which is when Mr. Fixit enters the fray. Fisk's goon is slapped aside like a piece of unwanted salami, and then Fisk, who has gone toe to toe with Spider Man, who, as we know from part one of this list, is usually holding back, comes bull charging at Fixit, who obviously tanks three blows without flinching before grabbing Wilson's fist, hoisting the massive villain over his head, and then throwing him through the floor into the casino, and then picking him up and slamming him down into the floor again, and then holding his arm hostage until Fisk says that the meeting is over in English, then French, then Pig Latin. Priceless. Number five, Superman versus the Joker. The Injustice video game and comic books took the simple premise of an evil Superman and turned it into an awesome story with really cool moments. The designs created for the heroes are mostly really, really cool and only slight variations of their best looks. The reasons that heroes and villains choose sides against one another is also really, really cool. And it gives some of the most ridiculous shows of force for Superman himself. But it all kicks off with one simple event. The Joker decides that he has become bored of Gotham, so he turns his gaze on Metropolis. The dark and twisted games that this character plays work really well with Batman, who is in reality just a normal human named Bruce Wayne. But when the Joker has to face someone with actual power, he is exponentially way more likely to come out on the bottom. So when he decided to crack Superman by tricking the hero into ending the life of Lois Lane and then blowing up a large part of Metropolis, he does succeed for just a few hours until Superman shows up in the room where the clown is being interrogated by Batman and Superman just bursts in ignoring Batman completely and in one cold move he plunges his fist straight through the Joker's chest stopping his heart immediately. And number four, Midnight versus Commander. The Authority is a really, really cool group from DC Comics' Wildstorm universe. The two most well-known heroes from the team would be Apollo and Midnighter who are basically like Superman and Batman Man, respectively, only these two are husband and husband, and Midnighter is almost insane. He is like Batman, but like Batman who is also mixed with the Punisher and maybe like a bit of Deadpool. And these stories get dark. In Mark Miller's run on the Authority, a villain by the name of Commander makes the very big mistake of attacking and forcing himself on Apollo. This was a hell of a mistake, because in response to those actions, Apollo, after recovering, burns Commander's legs so that he can't escape, and Midnighter shows up with a jackhammer. And the rest is something we are kept from seeing. If you want to check it out for yourself, you may be my guest, but you've been warned, it is quite haunting. Number three, Captain Cold versus Johnny Quick. If you have not read Forever Evil, I highly recommend you do. It's such a dark and crazy story that sees the villains of the DC Universe step into the heroic side to take down an evil Justice League from the alternate reality of Earth 3. Each member of this crime syndicate of America is a sick and twisted perversion of their prime Earth counterpart. But of all of them, Johnny Quick, the stand-in for The Flash, may be the most messed up. He's a completely deranged serial killer in his world. And one villain just can't stand for someone dragging The Flash's name in the dirt like that. Leonard Snart, 
Captain Cold. In their confrontation, Mr. Quick gets a hold of Cold's weapon, the Cold Gun, and then gloats about how he had taken the life of the alternate Snart on Earth 3 and how Captain Cold is defenseless without his finger on the trigger of his weapon. Well, turns out that Snart singing Jingle Bells Batman Smells activates the Cold Gun voice trigger which then completely freezes Quick's leg, which is when Captain Cold takes his big old right boot heel and completely shatters this maniac's leg. Have fun accessing the speed force now, psycho! <laughs> In at number two, Black Panther and the Skrulls. Wakanda, like the other fictional kingdoms of Atlantis and Latveria, is protected by a man who will do anything to protect his people. T'Challa doesn't really have the luxury of sparing those that would do harm to his incredibly advanced home. But Wakanda is also one of the number one places targeted when an invading force wants to take over Earth. So, taking those two facts into account, when the Skrulls tried to invade Wakanda to start their mission of dominating the world, T'Challa and his wife Storm of the X-Men left those aliens with a clear message. After tricking the Skrulls into inflicting pain on their own men for information, the Skrulls sent out their best warriors for the task of taking down the pair. But just as those toughest warriors are gone from sight, an army of Wakandan soldiers breaks into the Skrull ship and leaves not a single Skrull soul alive. While that's happening, those quote toughest warriors are turned into pulp by Black Panther, with T'Challa using their blood to write quote, this is what happens when you invade Wakanda on the bridge of the Skrull ship, cold. Number one, Constantine versus Dr. Fate. It's funny, I never really thought I'd see Dr. Fate as a villain. And in a way, this isn't exactly that. It's more like the helmet of fate and Naboo himself is the villain. In Constantine Future's End, John has stolen the helmet of fate, who without a wearer is just a measly old artifact with one of the world's most powerful sorcerers trapped inside. Allowing himself to get ensnared by the helmet, linking John and Naboo's minds, John trapped Naboo in the auditorium of Anubis. He fairly challenges Naboo to prove that he has actually ever cared about anyone other than himself in front of the ancient Egyptian god. If Nabu wins, then Constantine dies and Nabu is free to do what he does. Despite his great deeds though, he can't actually prove that he cares about anyone. When Constantine summoned the helmet, it immediately started influencing people to come and claim the helmet and save Nabu. But Constantine had set up a man to subdue each person that was called by the helmet, and when one person didn't make it, another would be called, and then another, and another, and so on. Each person just being used as a tool by Naboo who didn't care what happened to any of them. He proves that Naboo doesn't give a damn and then Naboo is eaten by Anubis, just straight up eaten. Now it turns out even the challenge was a trick, with Constantine making a deal with the demon Ifrit who now inhabits the Helmet of Fate in the place of and sort of alongside Naboo, bargaining with those who choose to wear the helmet from this point forward. Coming in at number 10 is Batman vs Prometheus. This may be one of the silliest yet coldest Batman Batman takedowns I have ever seen. In fact, down in the comments, I want you guys to let me know your favorite absolutely wacky Batman takedowns. But for now, let me explain this one. The first time Prometheus encounters the Justice League, and specifically Batman, he overcomes them all, just showing how much of a force to be reckoned with that he is. As for how he brought down Batman in hand to hand combat, the villain does what all villains do and gloats about how he did it. Using his helmet, he is able to program the skills of the 30 greatest martial arts masters in the world, including Batman himself into his body and brain for his own use. Not one to be outdone like that though. When the time comes for the rematch, Batman cheats and forces Prometheus into using an older version of his helmet, but this version had been tampered with by Batman so that instead of the 30 greatest martial artists, Prometheus now has access to the physical abilities and skills of none other than Professor Stephen Hawking. Now Batman could very easily punch the lights out of Prometheus who is stuck with muscular neuron disease that renders him a drooling catatonic. God it's, it's almost offensive, but it's just so good and such a Batman thing to do, like out thinking his opponent like that? Mm. Ah. Number 9, Magneto versus the Red Skull. Magneto and the Red Skull are on opposite sides of history. Magneto grew up in a Jewish family living in Germany during World War II, and we all know Red Skull and Hydra stance in World War II Germany. So, it's safe to say that these two villains will almost never get along. Right? In Acts of Vengeance from 1989, Magneto and Red Skull were actually 
temporarily united. But it's really important to note that Magneto was unsure whether this was the Red Skull that aided Germany in the slaughter of his people. So Magneto confronted him and the Red Skull confirmed that he was indeed the original, which was a mistake. It didn't take much for Magneto, the master of magnetism, to overpower the skull. But unlike what you might think, Magneto does not take his life. Instead, Magneto leaves the skull isolated in a stripped down fallout shelter 20 feet underground. He removed the ladder from the escape hatch, gave him 10 gallons of water, took out his homing transmitters, gave him no food and no light, just water, air, and his own depraved thoughts. Number 8. Peter Parker vs Kingpin If there's one thing you just don't do, it's messing with Aunt May. After Peter had revealed his identity to the world, his past villains were all coming back to get some more personal revenge. This put his family in danger, and despite his best attempts to protect them, when an assassin tried to bring him down, he dodged out of the way and Aunt May happened to be in the line of fire. This transitioned immediately to the Back in Black Spider-Man arc, which saw Peter don his black spider suit and go on a warpath to find out who was responsible for hiring the assassin. Eventually, Peter learns that it was none other than Kingpin who hired the goon. Fisk was in prison at this time, but using an extremely large stash of cash that he somehow had hidden within his prison furniture. I don't know, it's a comic book, just roll with it. Fisk was able to get out of his cell, release the other inmates, and get about halfway through the prison before Spider-Man came crashing in. And after letting Kingpin monologue a little bit, he proceeds to lay an incredible beatdown on the Kingpin of crime in front of an entire prison wing of his underlings. But then, to make it much more personal, Spider-Man takes off the black suit to show that it, it's Peter Parker beating the snot out of Kingpin. Then he slaps the hell out of Fisk, threatens to spin webbing down his throat, and then explains how pathetic he is in front of all of his underlings, striking right at the Kingpin's massive pride. Number 7. Jericho vs Vigilante Joey Wilson, aka Jericho, is technically usually a superhero, despite being the son of Deathstroke, one of the world's best assassins. The same serum that gave Deathstroke his powers and enhancements also gave Jericho his powers, but they differ largely from Deathstroke's. Jericho has a very unique and powerful ability that allows him to transfer his consciousness into the body of another and take control of them by making eye contact with that person. Unfortunately, Every time he did this, a small shred of the individual psyche remained in his head. At first, it was nothing that he couldn't deal with, but over time, possessing multiple people, he had so many psyches running around his head, it drove him insane and put him on a warpath that needed to see him brought down. The rogue anti-hero known as Vigilante was the one to take on the responsibility of stopping Jericho. But because of Jericho's sister insisting that Jericho was a good person at heart and should not lose his life, Vigilante decided to not deal with this threat in a completely lethal way. No, instead, Vigilante just completely took Jericho's eyes from his head. Blind and unable to use his powers, the threat of his abilities was gone. But I'm pretty sure it did nothing to stop his mental instability. In fact, it likely made it worse. Number 6. Wally West vs Inertia Inertia was a young villainous Thaddeus Thawne. Inertia is to Bart Allen, aka Impulse, what Eobard Thawne is to Barry Allen. He is his reverse. Now, Inertia had been raised his whole life to absolutely despise speedsters of any kind. He learned to be a villain from others, but his actions were all of his own. So when Inertia made the mistake of taking the life of his opposite, Bart Allen, he would be made to suffer the consequences. Unfortunately for him, those consequences came in the form of Wally West, one of the most powerful speedsters Ever. After taunting Wally about the fact he just took the life of his sidekick in All Flash number one, Wally takes the young villain who had the potential to be reformed, mind you, and removes his ability to move at all, traps Inertia in a museum as one of the exhibits, only able to blink once every hundred years, and leaves the kid there still thinking in real time during all of this, meaning he's driven slowly and pretty surely insane. And just as the cherry on top, Wally left him facing the exhibit of Bart. Allen, the man that Inertia could have been. It's an incredibly dark fate for a hero to impose on a villain, especially one that small. Number five, take heart, Kitty. Oof, this one hits me right in the feels. I go back to what it felt like the first time I read this one, and whoo, it got me. This defeat comes to us from the pages of one of my favorite ever X books, I believe, the first volume of Marauders, which started back in 2019. I think this is one of my favorite X books of all time. I mean, I'd have to really like think about that and rank those, but pretty sure this is up there if it's not in the top five. Although, I think it is in the top five. 
for me. In issue number six, we're caught off guard when Sebastian Shaw shows up on a boat where Captain Kate, the leader of the Marauders, has been left alone. Now, for those who haven't been keeping up with, you know, the Krakoa era X Men stuff and what it means for Kitty Pride, initially she had problems using the gates on the island and basically became the captain of a ship and the leader of the Marauders. Not Sinister's Marauders, not those Marauders. She was reclaiming the name for a heroic group of buccaneers that would basically sail the seas and help to free mutants in countries where they otherwise were not free, helping to bring them to Krakoa. And honestly, the team is also star studded. Here, Kitty preferred to go by Kate. That is, until she died. Sebastian Shaw shows up to attack Kate with fast growing Krakoa seeds. Considering she can't use the gates and currently can't phase through Krakoan materials, Kate becomes restrained as a result. Lockheed is netted and tossed overboard, and Kate is left to sink alone along with the ship she is on, which Sebastian, of course, blows a hole in. This plot point is made even more devastating by the implication that Kate will not be able to be resurrected, as this plot point is made even more devastating by the implication that Kate will not be able to be resurrected by the five as a result of her inability to interact with Krakoan Gates. Number four, everything cracked. The final crisis story is all about the brutal defeat of superheroes and really kind of like everyone on Earth. Final Crisis was the story of how Darkseid basically took over the world by broadcasting the anti-life equation to everyone on the planet via email, text, radio, and television broadcasts, basically making them realize that he is the one true ruler of everything and so they may as well just give up and surrender to him. It was brutal, devastating, and honestly affected pr pretty much everybody in the comics. Eventually the heroes would manage to rise up and take back the planet, but for a while there, oh, it was really bleak. Things got got so bad that they even caused Batman to break his one rule against using guns in order to take on Darkseid. And this event started with the death of Martian Manhunter as well. Rough. Number 3, Starro versus the Justice League. Despite how ridiculous the idea of a massive starfish looking alien that can control minds is, Starro the Conqueror is still one of the Justice League's earliest and most dangerous foes. All the way back in the Brave and the Bold issue 28 from 1960 is our first First ever introduction to Starro. Now, this was before he used starfish face huggers to control minds and instead would use a telepathic beam to control huge scores of people. When Starro did this to a town of people using one of his deputies, the Flash happened to take note of the fact that one kid, Snapper Carr, who was possibly the most annoying kid to grace the pages of comics, was immune to the effects of Starro's mental control. But it was a mystery as to why. It turns out that Snapper was covered in calcium oxide, aka lime from when he was working on a lawn earlier in the day. Lime, used by oystermen to fight starfish off of their oysters, also happens to block the powers of Starro, curiously enough, and so Green Lantern grabs a bunch of barrels of the stuff from a nearby farm, and the Flash grabs bags and bags of it from a chemical warehouse, and they team up to proceed to absolutely cover Starro in lime, imprisoning the Conqueror in an unbreakable shell of lime. As it sets in the comics, a living statue of lime. Number two, fire Storm versus Parasite. Rudolph Jones found himself exposed to a strange form of radiation, which changed him into a bald, green skinned parasite with the ability to absorb the life energy of others. Well, in Firestorm, the Nuclear Man, issue number 86, Parasite is released from an area he is being held in and goes on a rampage, draining multiple people of their life energy, including Firehawk, who fell pretty easily to this villain. Now, luckily, the hero Firestorm is nearby. At this point in time, Firestorm has become the world's fire elemental and received a pretty significant power boost. Almost as if to prove this, Firestorm comes in hot on Parasite with a blast of flame and then when Parasite tries to drain Firestorm's power, the hero is completely unaffected as he says, quote, my powers come not from myself but from the earth. I don't have power, I am power. And in a last ditch effort, Parasite decides to try and trade energy blasts with Firestorm. Now unfortunately for Parasite, it is nowhere near an equal fight. He uses up all of the energy he took from Firestorm and then just trying to hold back Firestorm's blast, Parasite goes through his own reserved life energy until he is on 
the brink. Realizing he will lose, he begs Firestorm to stop, saying that Firestorm would bring the end for Parasite, to which Firestorm simply says, that was my intention. Luckily for him, Parasite was saved by the allies of Firestorm who told him to stop, but this hero left Parasite emaciated from using up his own energy. And finally, and at number one, is Joker versus the Red Skull. Now look, the Joker is a maniac, an absolutely insane criminal lunatic, but hey, he is an American criminal lunatic, god damn. Which means dealing with someone with the past of the Red Skull is an absolute no-no. Yes, these two villains teamed up together in the Batman and Captain America team up special, back when DC and Marvel actually got along with each other. Naturally, these heroes' two greatest villains team up to take them on, but I guess it turns out that even Joker is above the morals of a World War II era war criminal. The Red Skull hires the Joker to steal an atomic doomsday device, which the Clown Prince of Crime totally agrees to do, until he sees Red Skull waltz out with a certain symbol front and center on his outfit, indicating his involvement in WW2, which is then confidently confirmed by the Red Skull. This is when the Joker delivers the line about being an American criminal lunatic, and the two simultaneously attack each other, Joker with his venom and the Red Skull with his, quote, dust of death, which they are both immune to. This is when Joker gets smacked over the back of the head with a wrench, but eventually the fight makes it onto a plane where the Joker overpowers Red Skull and they both go tumbling down through the sky alongside the atomic device they stole, destroying them both in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Now I don't know if I'm more shocked at Joker's switching of sides, or the fact that they had a fist fight while straddling the top of an active fat boy. It could be either, I don't know. Number 10, Blockbuster. Just like the video rental store that lives far off in a warm place in some of our memories, the villain of the same name, Blockbuster, met a very swift and some could say unjust end. Blockbuster may be a relatively unknown villain to some, and that may be due to the fact that he was primarily a Nightwing villain operating in Bloodhaven. In a tragic series of events, Blockbuster's mother passed away, and Blockbuster blamed this on Nightwing. He set out on a campaign to ruin the hero's life, attempting to take away anything and anyone that mattered to Dick Grayson instead of trying to hurt Nightwing himself. When Nightwing was at his absolute lowest in Nightwing 1996 number 93 from 2004, after a slog of a fight that moved out onto a fire escape, Nightwing had Blockbuster on the ropes when the new vigilante, Tarantula, showed up ready to bring Blockbuster to an end. Now, in a move I just did not see coming, Nightwing leaves his morals at the door, realizing Blockbuster will never stop, and he steps aside to allow Tarantula to end the villain's life. He then went and freaked the hell out while Tarantula started to seduce him. It was really weird, but it happened. Number 9, Spider-Man vs. Fire Lord. I think it is a well-known fact that Spider-Man pulls his punches. It's part of the reason and he is one of the best heroes, but I always forget how much he actually pulls those punches. For example, in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 270, a black suited Spider-Man puts one hell of a beating on a former Herald of Galactus, Fire Lord. Previously, Fire Lord had been wandering the cosmos when he stopped in New York to enjoy the uh, culture, I guess, only to be attacked by firemen and then kicked in the face by Spider-Man. Now, the Lord of Fire wants his revenge. After leading Fire Lord on a merry chase, through office buildings, Grand Central Station, the subway system, into a construction zone, having a building demolished on top of the fiery villain, and then leading him to a gas station which explodes, Spider-Man, at his wit's end, musters all his effort and his spider sense to lay an incredible beatdown of speed, agility, and raw strength on Fire Lord, getting so lost in his bloodlust until Captain America and the Avengers show up to be like, dude, you got him. Chill out. And in at number 8 is Deadpool vs. Bullseye. Reading through issue 11 of the 2008 volume of Deadpool just made me remember why I love Deadpool. Not that I forgot or anything, but man, he's just nuts, which makes it so good when the foe he faces is almost just as bonkers as he is. This time, it's Hawkeye, but not actually Hawkeye. It's actually Bullseye dressed as Hawkeye because this is happening during Dark Reign, and that's a long story on its own, which maybe we should do an attempt to explain of that at some point. For now though, Bullseye slash Hawkeye has been contracted to take down Deadpool. In the last issue, he managed to get an arrow right through Mr. Pool's noggin. So, in this 
issue, Deadpool takes it out and his brain is still half regenerated as he tries to take on Bullseye at this meat farm. Now listening to his half formed brain, Deadpool takes cover into a meat locker and decides his best course of action is to quote, be the meat. And he suits up in a butchered pig, using it as makeshift armor. Wade charges Mr. I, who had conveniently run out of arrows, lands a good crack, rack, and a crock, and then takes a swift kick to the no man's land. The fight transitions to the kitchen where Bulls Hawkeye, or whatever you want to call him, comes at Wade with a buzzsaw and Deadpool wielding two meat hooks, trips, grips, and sends a hook straight through this fellow mercenary's chest. The dynamic between these two psychos is just a treat to read, but I'd honestly recommend just reading the whole of this volume of Deadpool itself. It's fantastic. Number seven, you are not my father. Probably one of the most emotional fights, especially when we consider that at the time we had a lot of complex emotions about, uh, well, at least one of these people, happens between Professor Charles Xavier and his star pupil, Scott Summers, aka Cyclops. I'll let you guess about who we had complex feelings about. This one went down during the events of Avengers vs. X Men. It happens at a tense time in the history of the X Men. Not just because they were up against and at conflict with the Avengers as a result of a debate about what to do with the incoming Phoenix Force, but because of the revelations that had happened in recent years in regards to Charles's more shady practices. Like, not telling his students that the danger room they were training in had actually itself become a sentient AI mutant who was in essence uh, kind of being oppressed by the headmaster of the Xavier Institute, for example. In the end, Charles attempted to talk down Scott, who at this point had the full power of the Phoenix Force, or he takes the full power of the Phoenix Force during this fight, and uses it at his fingertips. Basically, he was also being corrupted by that. Himself filled with a bunch of complex feelings at the time in regards to Charles, Cyclops ends up refusing his once mentor's help, and instead kills him in a blaze of phoenix flames. Despite the fact that Charles at this point was a controversial figure, he was still, I would say, considered to be more hero than villain. And despite the fact that Cyclops himself is usually known for being a hero, he still defeated a man often also known for his own heroic and idealistic dreams. Number 6. The Day the Proudest Most Noble Man Ever Finally Fell Obviously I'm kinda trimming down that quote a bit, but it just fits a little bit better in my point. What an iconic defeat. So iconic it not only shook the comic book world, but also the everyday world as well, making headlines. And sure, all in all, this was kind of a publicity stunt to help boost comic sales, but it also became a huge story for comic book fans everywhere to look back on for years to come. While well, Superman would return, his defeat against Doomsday and ultimate initial death in the comics would be felt the world over. The death of Superman is epic, and I personally always like coming back to it, not just for Clark himself, but for the characters that are a big part of his world. Lois and Jimmy, his parents, John and Martha, ugh, makes me feel so many emotions. Also, why was Jimmy so handsome in the 90s? I ask myself that every time I return to Superman comics in the 90s. I'm like, Jimmy, you're looking real jacked. Number 5. Invincible. Invincible, Mark Grayson, is an incredibly strong character. Being a Vilchermite, Invincible is a member of one of the most unbeatable species in the galaxy. Mark is also a young adult, who hasn't learned how to control himself or his powers completely. So it's interesting that one of his greatest enemies is an incredibly squishy man by the name of Angstrom Levy. That's because Angstrom is pretty intelligent and ruthless, but also because he has the ability to open portals to alternate realities. Using his knowledge of other dimensions, he was able to figure out the alter ego of Invincible and find out where Mark lives. He travels to Mark's home and then captures Mark's mom and brother. First of all, making things this personal never works out for a villain, so they need to stop doing that. But Angstrom does actually put Mark through a good old fight, using portals to send the hero to multiple different dimensions, which was really cool, honestly. Where Levy made a big mistake though was when Mark's mom, Debbie, decides to try and attack the villain using a lamp, smashing it over Levy's big old head. Levy didn't take too kindly to this little affront and he broke Debbie's arm. Now in a fit of absolute blinding rage after seeing this, Mark charges full force at Levy and they end up crashing through multiple realities until they land in a sandy desert wasteland. Which is when this idiotic guy Levy decides to threaten Mark's family again. Invincible, still in this blind rage, uses all the strength he has, completely pummeling Levy until Mark looks like he's covered in ketchup and Angstrom is now a huge puddle. But somehow, 
he still comes back. Number 4 Conquest Yes we're still talking about Invincible. For the Viltrumites of this Invincible comic series they have extremely high resistance to damage but what makes them even more capable is that when they do get beat down usually by another Viltrumite and they survive the damage once they heal up they become even stronger than they were before. It's why the oldest Viltrumites are usually the most powerful of the bunch. Now one old timer Viltrumite goes by the name of Conquest and he is one grizzled old man. Battle scarred as hell with a cybernetic arm and psychotic as hell as well, he arrives on Earth to check on Mark's progress with taking over the planet. That's a whole long story, we don't need to get into it. Essentially, he arrives after Mark had just gone through some sh**. I can't say that. So Mark is not in the best mood, but Conquest does not care and these two have an absolute slog of a battle over the course of four issues of the comic. It's Insane. Conquest takes a few hits, sure, but Mark is no match for this guy in the slightest. In an attempt to help Invincible, his girl, Adam Eve, decides to show up on the battlefield and lend a hand. And she was far out of her league, but she's very powerful. Didn't really matter. Conquest punched a hole right through her. This was the line that you just don't cross. It sends Mark into a frenzy. The two Superman like beings fly straight at one another and Mark punches straight through Conquest's cybernetic arm, breaking his own arm in the process. He uses his unbroken hand to clock the old man in the face, he bites a massive chunk out of the guy's shoulder, Adam Eve revives herself out of nowhere, lends a helpful blast, and then when Conquest breaks Mark's other hand, this guy uses his head and headbutts Conquest over and over and over again. It was like 15 hits until what was once his head is now a stomped on can of crushed tomatoes. I don't know if we can even show this one, but it's just insane. Number three, Squirrel Girl versus Doctor Doom. Look, we're talking comic books here, okay? Just keep that in mind. In Marvel Super Heroes number eight from 1992, in one corner, we've got the full, untested, unbridled powerhouse of Squirrel Girl. And then, in the other corner, we have the Fantastic Four's top enemy, the ruler of Latveria, the man who has wielded the power of the Beyonder, constantly blends incredible technology with powerful magic and artifacts, fueled by his massive, deserved ego. It's the one and only Dr. Victor Von Doom. Who's the winner? Obviously, it's Squirrel Girl. What the hell? Summoning a monstrous horde of squirrels that completely swarm Doom as he cries out, My much vaunted technology decimated by these gnawing rodents. And he escapes through a trap door, diving into a river and leaving behind his mask, which Squirrel Girl takes as a trophy. Of all the defeats on this list, this one is definitely brutal. Completely tore that man's pride straight from him and sent him running and screaming with a whole cacophony of squirrels. Damn. That was kind of fun. <clears throat> Number two, Mr. Dumpo. I know, I'm surprised the Punisher has not shown up on this list too, until now. Honestly, I can tell you why. The Punisher doesn't really have that many memorable villains because his whole thing is that he doesn't let them live. Usually his villains are gone from existence by the end of the issue and definitely before the end of the series. And usually he does it very quickly and very easily, but definitely not always. In the Punisher volume 5, number 11, the Punisher is facing off against a guy called the Russian, who was hired by another bigger bad who we talk about just, just in a moment. When the two finally come face to face, the fight sees them tumble through Frank's apartment building, crashing into the apartment of Frank's neighbor, Mr. Dumpo. Mr. Dumpo is not the smallest man. In, in fact, I'd say he's quite large. Yeah, that's how I'd put it. Using a fresh out of the oven scolding hot slice of pizza belonging to Mr. Dumpo, Frank burns the Russian's face, and then Frank then takes Mr. Dumpo and tosses him on top of the Russian and dog piles on top suffocating the Russian to his demise. Could you imagine going out like that? Just take a moment and think about it. That would be horrible. Number one, Ma Nyochi. That's how I'm gonna say it. I said we were about to talk about another Punisher villain, and I wasn't lying. Ma Nyochi, or Nyochi, or however you, tell me how you pronounce that in the comments below, just, I can't figure it out. She's the head of the Nyochi crime family, so yeah, she ain't really a nice lady. Now, before the moment I'm about to talk about, Frank had thought that he had already neutralized the threat of old Ma here, and that's because he literally fed her to a gaggle of polar bears. Now, while they didn't finish her off, the bears did happen to relieve Ma of her arms and legs. It was that action that prompted the hiring of the Russian at the last point. Now in the Punisher volume 5 number 12, after taking down about 
80, yes, 80 of her thugs, Punisher comes back to finish the job. 80 men were already obliterated, so no one was willing to lend the legless and armless head of crime a hand as Frank burned down her mansion. She put up a decent fight with no limbs though, sort of, after she attempted to gnaw his ankles off unsurprisingly unsuccessfully. Frank uses his big old foot, plus the muscles in his leg, and not so gently places this helpless, horrible woman into the burning pyre that used to be her home. Cold. Or hot, actually, cause fire. Coming in at number 10 is Daredevil vs Bullseye. Imagine being the guy who continuously gets his butt handed to him by Daredevil to the point that you've been saved and brought back too multiple times with enhancements and he still leaves you stuck in an iron lung with the ability to do nothing but stare and talk very quietly. Imagine being that guy and in another act of attempted vengeance you mastermind a whole evil plan to get your revenge with your limited communication abilities and then in Daredevil Volume 3 number 27 this red suited man without fear unravels travels your plans and then makes sure the jar that's keeping you alive gets filled with a toxic chemical leaving you completely blind. Well, that's what happened to Bullseye. As Foggy Nelson said, once the deadliest man in the world and now all he will be is a living brain inside a flesh and bone coffin. That's terrifying. Number 9. The Hulk vs Abomination Abomination in the MCU was once an incredibly intimidating villain and he still sort of is but also like kind of like a hippie. And kind of funny. In the comics though, Emil Blonsky is absolutely ruthless. General rule for the MCU movies for you right here. If you like a character, just imagine them doing everything they do, but like turn it up to 10 and then you'll have their comic book counterpart. Mostly. What my point is here is that the Abomination is psychotic and the Hulk is way more brutal. So when the Abomination took the life of Betty Ross using his irradiated blood, he was not getting out of it easy. When they come head to head in The Incredible Hulk Volume 25 from 2000, it's arguably one of the best Incredible Hulk fights I've ever seen. Emil comes walking out of the water and before he even knows what happens, Hulk is on him like shrimps on the bobby. The ground around them almost instantly becomes rubble. The fight travels under water and through a dam, flooding a whole town, all the while these two green goliaths are in a close combat slog match. And then Emil decides to taunt the Hulk, which is just dumb because it just makes him angrier, increasing his strength, and the Hulk absolutely pummels the abomination, laying on fist after fist after fist after causing minor earthquakes and leaving a meal on the edge of life with his brain exposed. It's insane. This comic really shows the relationship between these two on a level that's not really captured anywhere else and you should read it just for their relationship, honestly. Number 8, Batman vs thugs. Have you ever played the Batman Arkham games? The combat in those games is absolutely fantastic, but it still leaves me wondering how many of these random street thugs actually survive after their interaction with Batman, because I doubt it. He hits hard, and he is pretty unforgiving about it. Which serves his whole point of instilling fear, sure, but I think because these nameless thugs are cannon fodder, they essentially get the worst beatings of most of Batman's villains, and we never hear from most of them again. So that tells you all you need to know. As an example, let's talk about a group of thugs in the All-Star Batman and Robin series issue number 7. Now this comic is written by Frank Miller, who seems to be able to get away with making Batman do pretty much anything I guess, like there's no rules with Frank Miller. Like in the opening pages of the issue, Batman comes speeding into a group of armed thugs, foot first, maniacally laughing like the Joker and talking in his head about how Gotham is full of cockroaches. He relishes in the fact that the criminals are so scared that they are disposing of each other accidentally and then he sets fire to a bottle of bleach and tosses it into the criminals blanketing them in fire and then continuously beating the snot out of them while they're on fire. And then what happens next? You'll never guess because Black Canary pops up out of nowhere and these two superheroes just start making out and getting busy while the thugs are literally barbecuing in the background. Unfortunately, yes, this is Batman, but not my Batman. Mm -mm. Number 7, Superman and the Manchester Black Beatdown. What's so funny about truth, justice, and the American way? I don't know. But what I do know is that the Superman story that uses that question as its title, also known as Action Comics issue number 775 for any of you who want to know, is 
awesome. Essentially, this comic sees the arrival of a group of heroes called the Elite that fight crime but in an incredibly bombastic and brutal way with no regard for lives lost. This flies directly in the face of the moralities of heroes like Superman and Batman, but apparently not. The leader of this band of villainous heroes goes by the name Manchester Black and he has an incredible level of telekinesis, able to punch a hole in a mountain with a simple thought. He is incredibly capable and so are his team, fixing problems before Superman can even get to the scene. Now eventually, Superman, attempting to stop them from operating using such brutal forms of justice, gets his butt handed back to him during one of their first altercations. But that was Superman with the gloves on. As fast as a speeding bullet, Superman takes down the other three members of the elite, leaving only Manchester Black left. Now, in a move colder than I've ever seen before, Superman subtly uses his heat vision through Manchester's eye and cuts the connection between Chester and his telekinetic powers. Essentially, he lobotomized Chester using his heat vision, taking the ability to use his powers at least until the JLA could arrive, and he left the elite in an unconscious dog pile. Number 6, Magneto beating Apocalypse. Magneto and Apocalypse are two incredibly powerful mutant villains with frighteningly similar goals, and yet we never really fully see them teaming up. But we also rarely ever see them fight either, except in the Age of Apocalypse reality. In this world, the mutant Legion had gone back in time in an attempt to bring an end to Magneto, but he inadvertently caused the passing of Xavier, his father, which led to a world where Magneto forms and leads the X-Men, and Apocalypse has nearly taken over the whole world. This all came to a head in X-Men Omega. Now, on paper, while Magneto is powerful with a capital P, when compared to Apocalypse, he should be a walk in the park for the second mutant to ever exist, and their fight goes going on simultaneous with about 3 or 4 other little skirmishes is intense. It's full of great lines, crazy twists and turns, but the best part is right near the end. Apocalypse has Magneto on the ropes and he gloats in his own glory, wondering why the master of magnetism isn't fighting back. Now staring straight into Apocalypse's eyes, Magneto says, I can't, I'm concentrating. And then they both look down to see Magneto's hands at his abdomen as he completely rips Apocalypse in two straight down the middle in the most awesome looking panel I have ever seen. It's so good. And at number 5 is Batman vs the Hyper Clan. This point is eerily similar to the Manchester Black vs Superman point on part 2 of Brutal Villain Defeats. In 1997's JLA, helmed by Grant Morrison, a team of superheroes shows up on Earth and begins fixing problems and completely eradicating supervillains, gaining popularity with the people that rivals the Justice League. The difference here is that this team of superheroes are actually white Martians. Unsurprisingly, the first of the Justice League to find this out was Batman himself, who managed to evade being captured unlike the rest of the League. Sneaking into the Hyper Clan's base, he managed to lure one of their members, a mortal, who he strung up with a little batarang held sign that read, I know your secret. When three other members of the Hyper Clan showed up, Batman brought them down with a single match and a circle of gasoline, turning their one weakness to fire into his greatest ally because he's Batman. Number 4. Darkseid. Darkseid is not a character you mess with. He is incredibly powerful with an insanely capable mind and the ability to practically never pass away. Sure, we could talk about his defeat at the hands of Batman, but that's kind of boring. Batman's a regular guy, sure, but he's also Batman. What we want to talk about is volume 3, issue number 2 and 3 of this comic called Superpowers. This comic was made to go along with a toy line, so we already should slightly suspend our knowledge of what various heroes and villains are actually capable of for right now. Now, in the story, Darkseid's Omega effect had been dwindled to almost nothing thanks to Mr. Miracle, Tear, and Mr. Freeze. After being betrayed by his people, he winds up teleporting to Earth with the last of his energy. Now, covered in a cloak, Darkseid is forced to rob a store just to find more clothes and remain unnoticed. But just after he does so, Darkseid is confronted by a pair of muggers in an alleyway. A pair of regular old human muggers who bully him, threaten him, and then knock him out cold with a chain just to rifle through his pockets and run off into the night. But the best part is how he looks up with a big Darkseid frown and goes, Oh, surely my plight can sink no lower. You never see Darkseid like this, and certainly not in a fedora and a trench coat. 
Mwah. Number three, the one true enemy of the great Charles Xavier. Oh boy, we are going to the ultimate universe for this one, so you know it's gonna be brutal, right? This comes from the Ultimate X Men series. Here, Sinister, who looks super different in this universe, so if you're like, wait a minute, who's that? That's Sinister? Yeah, it is. He infiltrates the X Mansion and manages to sneak up on Charles Xavier himself, despite his immense telepathic powers. Xavier here is no match for Sinister, who takes him out of the security room he was in, where he was seemingly surveying his students. When Charles asks Sinister where he's taking him, Sinister responds that he's escorting Xavier to his one true enemy, and then he pushes him down some stairs. Hmm. It's completely awful, really. Xavier isn't the only one who gets brutally and honestly insultingly messed up by Sinister in this issue. Angel also in this fight goes from being intimidating in one panel to basically mentally manipulated into choking himself against his will in another panel. So yeah, which I mean, I don't know. I kind of expect something like that for Angel, but Xavier? It's not fair. It's not very. That's terrible. <laughs> Number two. Instead, I will simply break you. Possibly one of the most powerful moments I've ever read in Batman comics. This epic issue that was an integral part of the Nightfall story is a whirlwind of a fight. And not only that, but overseen by a powerful inner monologue from Batman about all the wounds he has taken to get to this point that truly highlights the struggles that really sum up this character, who against all odds always comes out on top. Right? Not this time. And issue number 497 of Batman. This was the moment that Bruce fell in his fight against Bane. Bane came to finish him, but rather than kill Batman, decided to simply leave him broken, breaking his back over his knee in that massive and iconic splash panel. Number one, but I saved you. I did it. Ugh, oh, this one made me cry all over again as I sat at my desk and reflected on it, revisiting it again. Oh boy, okay. So here we're talking about the death of Spider-Man, which honestly happened more than once in the ultimate comic book line and universe, but I do think that this is my favorite death. Hmm. This is Spider-Man's death done right, is what I mean, in my mind. If you have to do it, obviously, because I don't think many of us would really ask for something this heartbreaking to happen, but you know, here we are, it happened, and it's so sad. During Ultimate Spider-Man issue 159 through to issue 160, we see Peter in his final fight, in the final moments of this final fight. Unmasked and with nothing really left to lose, he is forced to give it his all to protect the people of New York City, and more specifically, his friends his family, his loved ones, and the people of his own neighborhood. In the end, despite everything he does in this epic fight, which spans multiple issues, he is defeated by the Green Goblin. And the ultimate version of the Green Goblin is an unstoppable, and as we'd later find out, a mortal tank of a villain. This fight and defeat has it all though. Ups, downs, it's an emotional, action-packed roller coaster. And while Spider-Man does seemingly die, so seemingly does Norman Osborn as well in the end. So while this is a defeat, there's also at least some poetic justice felt in the end too. But goodness, Aunt May, whew. Boy, do I feel for Aunt May here. Oh, it's so awful. Dude.